productivity hack in life. I could call this um, how to be more productive than you ever thought about being in your life. I could call this automatic success principles for every entrepreneur. But whatever you call it, the reality is you're about to learn some productivity hacks that will change your life for the rest of your life. So um, one of the best ways to figure out how to do anything better is to find somebody who's really, really good at it and then model them, right? Well, so as I started to think about productivity and the best way to be productive, I thought, like, who had more productivity in a short period of time than anybody else in human history, in world history? And, like, the first, first person that came to my mind was Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah. Like, you want to study productivity? Go to the book of Nehemiah. This dude rebuilt the walls around the city of Jerusalem with his team in 52 days, and he wasn't even a builder. He was a cupbearer, right? But he knew how to get things done. But that's not, the most, that's not the most productive anybody's ever been. The most productive anybody's been in world history is God when he created everything out of nothing in seven, six days and rested on the seventh day. So if you want to find the ultimate productivity hack, you have to go back to Genesis chapter 1. And you've heard me say this many times in the past. Like my favorite book in the Bible is Genesis. My favorite Chapter in Genesis is Genesis chapter one. There are so many success principles in Genesis chapter one. It's almost like God gave us a wink and said, in case you don't get to chapter two, I want you to be okay. So now I'm going to share with you productivity hacks that I use in my life and in my business that you can use in your life and your business that God used in Genesis chapter one. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is this, and I want y'all to give me an answer. Those of you who are alive, those of you who are on YouTube, you can type it in. God is... Great, good. Come on, y'all acting like y'all don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. Now, it got all quiet, like, like God, God who? No, no, that ain't it, y'all. That ain't the answer. Okay, so, so I'm going to do it again. God is great. great, okay, and God is good. And then somebody says all the time, and then we can say God is love, and we can say God is awesome, we can say God is omnipotent, we can say God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, God is holy. But here's what's really fascinating about God. When he introduced himself to us in Genesis chapter 1, he didn't tell us any of those things about him first. The first thing, when you meet somebody, the first thing you tell them about you is the most important thing you want them to know about you. What's the first thing God told us about God? In the beginning, God created the, heaven and the, the heavens and the earth. Now, I don't know what you do when you read that, but I started scratching my head. Now, why would he do that? And then somebody will say, well, they're going to get really spiritual and you're going to say, well, heaven is God's throne and earth is God's footstool. Cool. Was he tired? Did he need to sit down? Did he, were his feet hurt? No. So why would he create the heaven and the earth? And if you never wondered about that, I don't know. Maybe I'm the weird one. <laughs> okay, you don't have to answer that. Okay. So, so I wondered, and I, then I realized, oh, God created the heavens and the earth because he is creative and therefore it is his nature to create. So God created the heavens and the earth as an expression of his I amness as an expression of his creativity. So the first thing God tells us about God is that he's creative. Why is that important? It's important because he also told us, the first thing he told us about us is that he made us in his image and he created us after his likeness, which means he made us to make stuff and he created us to create stuff. That's why human beings cannot feel fulfilled unless they're creating something. And you might, you might like, so God put a different aspect he infused, he downloaded, he programmed a different aspect of his creativity inside of all of us. But he didn't download or install the same aspect of his creativity in any of us. That's why some people, he installed music and your creative abilities come out musically. Some of you, they come out engineerally. They come out in building things. Some of you, they come out in drawing things. Some of you, they come out in speaking. Some of them, you, they come out in teaching. But he put a different aspect of his creativity inside of all of us. And that's why, unless we, that's why people who, have, who are on what they call dead-end jobs, the reason they feel like they're a dead-end, because you're doing a task that doesn't utilize your creativity, and so you feel like you're wasting your life. Wow. See, God created human beings to be creative, and God created three categories in creation. He created, he created creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the grass, the water. He created creatures, the dogs, the cats, the fish, the birds, the alligators. And then he created creators, men and women. Wow. So... That's why it's stupid. I won't say it's stupid. I'll say it's stupid. I can't think of another word. Um, that's why it doesn't make sense to pray to the universe. 
It doesn't make sense to pray to the universe because you are greater than the universe. God created the universe as creation. He created you as a creator. God created creatures. That's why it doesn't make sense to worship animals. God created animals as creatures. In fact, the Hebrew word for animal is bahema, bahema, in it is what it is. A horse is a horse is a horse, of course. What? And for some of you who are a little older, you'll know what that means, right? Um, have you ever heard of a talking horse? Well, listen to this. I am Mr. Ed. Well, that, that was fun to watch. Why? Because human beings like to personify animals and things. That's why when we make cartoons, animals can talk. That's why when, like, we had, when I was a kid, they had a cartoon of a talking car right? Human beings love to create things in our image. Why? Because we're creating the image of God and he created us in his image. So we like to create things in our image, right? And so we have to make sure that when we're activating the creativity that's inside of us, we're not creating something that goes against the purpose for which he created us. Are y'all, are y'all tracking? Okay. So, so I've always thought, well, not always, but for a long time, I've thought, you know, Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You know, Genesis chapter one could have ended right there, right? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Then he starts going on all this detail. Why? Because he created us to be like him. Therefore, he didn't just create the heaven and the earth. He, after he told us he did it, he went back and showed us all the steps because he knew we were gonna have to apply these same principles to the things we create. Are y'all tracking? So in, seven, in six days, God created everything out of nothing. Well, we don't have the ability to create anything out of nothing. And I know people say you can speak things into existence. They've been wrong before. They'll be wrong again. And, and, and I don't, I, like, I'm, I'm not trying to be controversial or argumentative, but the reality is if you could speak something into existence, you would have already spoken something different into existence than what you got in existence right now. Can I get a witness? Where are my people? But what you can do is you can speak God's word into your life. And God's word spoken creates faith in a space in your life where doubt used to exist. And when faith is installed in the space where doubt used to exist, you can take an action in faith that you could not take in doubt. So therefore you do something you didn't do when you were doubting. You think you spoke the thing into existence and all you did was let yourself hear the word of God because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then it says, and the earth was without form. Now, do this on your own time, but do it. Go look up the word was. It's not the word used to be in Genesis chapter two. It's not the word, the earth used to be without form and void. Oh, no, 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 God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form. That word was is the word became. It became without form and void and darkness was on the face of the earth. So the first principle of productivity is this, intention. God's intention was to create. So the very foundational principle of all productivity is intention. You must set your intention to do the thing. Are y'all tracking? Wave at me, my people. Okay, so, so if, if, you are, if you are, your, your intention is to build a thing, then you have to understand, based on the laws of the universe, the laws of physics, like the law of energy, everything is energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes form, Right. By the way, can y'all tell by how long it's taken me to get to this, this is going to be a series, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so, but everything is energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes form, right? So um, a tree is growing in the forest. We go out, chop down the tree. We take the tree, we throw it in the fireplace, and the energy of the wood becomes the energy of fire. And the energy of fire turns the energy of the wood into the energy of ash, and we can take that out and plant it into our garden. It becomes the energy of fertilizer for our garden. And so it doesn't cease to exist. It just turns into something else. Well, if you understand... That, that like thoughts are even energy. Thoughts are, they're an, it's an electric impulse. So thoughts are energy. And so we have this energy in our head. And what we do is we convert that energy, that thought into an intention. And then that intention turns into an action and that action turns into a production, right? So it's really interesting. You have the law of energy. Then you have the law of entropy. Anything left to itself tends to move more and more towards disorder. What do we have after that? We have the law of polarity. For, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. For every positive, there's a negative. For every negative, there's a, there's a positive. Which shows us that there are always going to be two sides. For energy, there's entropy. For, in polarity, for negative, there's positive. In, in, de, in, in seasons, there's winter and summer, and there's spring and fall. They're opposites of each other. With, like, you have to have opposites or the thing can't exist. Right? Like, like, opposite, like opposites are existential to the nature of everything. 
There can be no good if there were no evil. There could be no love if there were no hate. Like everything requires an opposite to exist. Are y'all tracking? Okay. So, so we see intention. Here's why intention is so important. I have, I've, I've interacted with I don't, hundreds of millionaires, interacted with hundreds of millionaires. And I've had conversations and coached people who were not millionaires and becoming millionaires. Here's what I found out is the number one common denominator of people who are hyper successful, not just in money, but in any arena. It doesn't matter if it's sports. It doesn't matter if it's uh, music. It doesn't matter if it's money. The number one common denominator. Y'all ready? Here it is. Everybody say, I'm ready. ready. Okay, here it is. The number one common denominator for people who are hyper successful is they focus on intention and ignore distraction. The number one common denominator of average people is they focus on distraction and ignore intention. And people who focus on distraction and ignore intention, they think they're balanced. And they think you are obsessive and they think that you are obsessed and they think that you're out of balance because you're focused. And balance is not the objective of life. Balance is a season in life. It's never winter and summer in the same place at the same time, and you're never in focus and in balance at the same time. When you're in focus, you're out of balance. When you're in balance, you're out of focus. And if you're broke, you have not yet earned a season of balance. So you need to focus and have intention. Now, I know that. You should say, my money's not the most important thing in the world. I know, but it's what you ask for when you don't have none, and you can't feed your churn. You know I'm telling the truth. See, here's what we, we, I, oh, I, I don't care. That, I, I, hate, I hate it when people tell us. I don't care about money. You lying rascal. <laughs> if you'll lie about that, you'll lie about other stuff. So you working eight hours a day for something you don't care about. 16 hours a day for something you don't care about. Nobody believes that lie except you. And you don't really believe it, but you, you feel like you have to say it because here's what's really fascinating. People who are successful and make a lot of money, they feel like they have to make an excuse to people who are just watching a basketball game that has nothing to do with their life. I'm not going to make an excuse to anybody. I don't, like, I, I'm not going to apologize. I, I am not going to apologize for being rich. I'm not going to back in the door with it. I'm not, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to show, I'm not, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to brag about it either. Any good thing in my life is a gift. Even the intelligence to be able to create a fortune and the intention and the intensity to be able to create a fortune is a gift. Like, I get that and I'm grateful for it. So I have nothing in my life to be proud of and everything to be thankful for. But guess what? I am not going to apologize to somebody who sits around and watches football games, basketball games, golf tournaments, and baseball games all day and their life ain't working and now they want me to feel bad because my life is, man, ch- child, please. You better go ask somebody. Okay, so. So, focus on intention and ignore distraction. I'm going to define intention and distraction so you know I'm not just throwing words around. What's, my, what's the definition of intention? My definition of intention is anything that moves the needle in your favor, in your life. If it does not move the needle in your favor, it's a distraction. So, that's why I, I, remember, being, I remember being in elementary school, and I remember kids in elementary school having all the stats of their favorite baseball players and football players memorized. I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, why would you know that? Like, I, I can remember thinking this in elementary school. Why would you know that? These people don't even know you exist. And you know everything about their life. They know nothing about yours. And not only do they not, not know anything about you, they don't care about yours. They don't care. They live in large and take in charge. Why? Because they focused on intention while you're focusing on distraction. Their intention has become your distraction. Oh, snap. So the first productivity hack that will make you rich in 2023 is intention. You need to become more intentional. And I submit to you that if you are broke, one of the last things you should be seeking is balance. I was out of balance when I was broke. I was so focused. I'm sure the people around me thought I was a lunatic. All he cares about is money. No, it ain't all I care about. It's just the thing I care about the most when I don't have none. (laughs) Now that I got plenty, I don't focus on money at all. It's It's just money. Right? But when I didn't have any, oh, oh I, I couldn't think about nothing. Why? Because people kept reminding me. Every time I went to the store, they remind me, you got any money? <laughs> Every month they sent me an electric bill. They didn't want an excuse. They didn't even want a reason. They just wanted some money. So, focus on intention. Things that move the needle in your favor. Anything that doesn't move the needle in your favor is a distraction. So, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's his intention. His intention was set. Well, here's what happens next. In the, be- in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form. That word was, became. So in productivity, if you're not aware of this, you will get derailed and never get back on track. 
And what is that? Disruption always follows intention. If you set out to do something good, the first thing that shows up is something hard. It is so hot in here. If somebody can hook me up with some temperature, that'd be great. I'm cooking. Okay, thank you. Uh, like, whew. okay. So the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. The earth became without form and void and darkness upon the face, face of the deep. Here's what disruption looks like. It looks like um, deformity. It looks like emptiness. It looks like darkness. That's what disruption feels like. Like in our studio right now, we've got tape on the wall, baseboards missing, taped up plastic. The men's room is all taped up. You can't get in there. We got dehumidifiers running. Why? We were doing our challenge last month and our building flooded right while we were in the middle of it. Right, right in the middle of the challenge. Like the rain didn't even care we was in the middle of something. Right? Disruption always follows intention. When you say, if you decide, if you're out of shape and you decide I'm going to get in shape, I promise you, the first couple of days, maybe the first couple of weeks after you start exercising for the first time in a long time, you ain't going to feel stronger. No, baby, that ain't how this works. You're going to feel weaker. <laughs> you, like you thought you had pain when you were just sitting around. Now you're going to have some pain that follows you everywhere. Can I get a witness? Amen. Right? And so you don't feel better first. When you start a business, you don't make money first. You spend money first. It's just how it works. Disruption always follows intention. And if you don't know that, you'll think something's going wrong, but in essence, in reality, it's showing you that you're headed in the right direction. The disruption that follows your intention is a sign that you are on the right road. Hallelujah. Then it says, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So after disruption follows our intention, because we start with intention, and when disruption follows our intention, here's what we have to do. We have to seek a source of inspiration. I need, to ha I need something to happen. I need to observe something, feel something, learn something that makes me feel like it can get better. But not only it can get better, it's going to get better. So for me, my inspiration is books. Like, I love books. I am, there's, you will never... You will never see me on a day where I've not either read or listened to or I'm reading and I'm listening to an audiobook of some kind. Ever. Like ever. In the words of my brother Jeff, you cannot draw water from an empty well. You can't. See, see, I, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you because somebody I'm I'm gonna be faith, I'm gonna remember them faithful wounds of a friends we talked about last week. I'm gonna give you some of those right now. Myron, I don't understand why I don't have any followers. I don't understand why I don't have any subscribers. Because you're not good yet. They ain't going to follow you because you want followers. <laughs> they ain't going to subscribe because you want subscribers. You got to actually say something that matters to them. See, here's what happens. We show up in the marketplace, and we want to say something that matters to us, and we want everybody to care. I've got news for you. They don't like you that much. They don't like me that much. If I wasn't talking to you about stuff you can do, you wouldn't even be listening to me right now. You ain't listening to me because I'm talking to you about me. You listen to me because I'm talking to you about you. And see, some people are unwilling to get good, to take the time that's necessary to be good at a thing. And so what they do is they show up in the marketplace and they show everybody, hey, I'm not good yet. And so they've created a reputation that says, I'm not good. And so now you, all you've done is given people a reason to ignore you in the future. Mm -hmm, I wish I had some help in here. Hola. So, inspiration. You need to learn something you don't know. You need to learn to believe something that you used to doubt. You need to pursue something that's worthwhile. That's what you, like, it's really interesting. To me, it's interesting because I'm interested in everything. I'm that geeky person. Jeff, my brother Jeff's here. My brother Rob's here. They'll tell you. When I was a kid, I was most excited when I got a chemistry set for Christmas so I could make my own toothpaste. You can go buy toothpaste at the store. I wanted to make toothpaste. Why? Because they can make it. I can make it. Right? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I've always been that same dude, y'all. Okay. So what's really fascinating is, is a tree doesn't grow in one direction. A gr tree grows in two directions, but we only see the one direction in which it grows. But here's, what, here's, the, here's the important part. 
A tree has to grow down before it grows up. We, the, the roots of a tree, if you could see under the ground, the roots of the tree would, mer- would mirror the branches of the tree. Wow. A tree can only grow as tall successfully over time as its roots go deep. The deeper the roots go, the taller the tree can grow. Here's the problem. You're trying to grow tall and you don't have no roots. See, trees have a gravitropic nature, which means they grow away from light towards gravity. That's called gravitropic nature of a tree. But they also have a phototropic nature of a tree. What's that? It grows towards light and away from gravity. Guess what? You're the same way. Maybe that's why it says in the book of Psalms, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in the season. The leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You have to have the gravitropic nature of a tree. You have to grow your roots deep into truth, into principle, so that you can grow your branches high into the sky towards the sun. Are y'all tracking? Is what, is what I'm saying making sense? Okay, so, so we see, first of all, intention. We see disruption that follows intention. We see inspiration that we need to find after the disruption follows our intention. And then it says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. The next thing that happens is illumination. What's illumination? Illumination is when you learn something you didn't know before. Here's the problem. Most people think that they see with their eyes. But the scripture says a a wise man's eyes are in his head. Hmm. What does that tell me? Well, I see with my mind. My eyes are only one of the things my mind uses to see. That's why somebody like Helen Keller, even though her eyes couldn't see, she had more vision than you and me. Helen Keller said, security does not exist in all of nature. Neither do the sons of men as a whole experience it. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. Let me ask you a question. Are you allowing your life to be the daring adventure that God ordained that it should be? Are you protecting yourself from that so that your life becomes nothing at all? Start using your mind to see truth not just your eyes to see what's in front of you. Maybe that's why the scripture says we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. Why? I can't believe my eyes because my eyes tell lies. See, doubt is created in the eyes, but faith is created in the ears. And so the after, I, I need illumination. I need to learn something. Okay, I need to learn something I don't know. Here's why. The difference between where you are right now and what you can do and who you are and who you could be and what you have and what you could have is exactly the same as the difference between what you know and what you haven't learned and implemented yet. That's where the gap lies. See, if you knew better, you could do better. Can I get a witness? Let me hear y'all say, if I knew better, I, knew better. I could do better. Could do better. So here's, here's, here's my advice. Go learn better. Where should I look? Everywhere. Everywhere you find a voice of truth, look there. Illumination. And God said, let there be light. And guess what? There was light. Ha <laughs> ha. Imagine that. See, I, I, and I know y'all heard me tell the story before, but when I was working on this car with my dad when he was a little kid and, I, and we were going to lunch, I said, dad, the bolt's not coming. We were trying to get this rusty bolt out. I said, dad, it's not coming out. It's not coming out. He said, oh, it's coming out. It's coming out. You, like, you, I've never, like, I, y'all think I'm matter of fact. I got it from my dad. I've never met anybody more matter of fact in my life, right? He's just like, oh, it's coming out. You know why it's coming out, boy? No, sir. Because we got a brain that don't have a brain. We have a brain that doesn't have a brain, and that's why it has to come out. Oh, okay. And sure enough, right after lunch, we went out and got the bolt out. I have a picture that my brother Rob took on, in my office of my dad and Jarvis, a family friend, working under the hood of a car. My name for that picture is, we have a brain. God said, let there be light, and there was light. What happens? After you learn the thing you didn't know. See, a lack of knowledge is a form of darkness. When you learn the thing you didn't know, now something happens that couldn't happen before. So we see intention. We see disruption follows intention. We see inspiration, and then we see illumination. But it gets more better. This is is amazing. Watch this. It says, and God said, let it be light. There was light. And God saw the light that it was good. Recognition is a part of productivity. See, some of y'all ain't doing better because when you did good, you didn't stop and celebrate. I remember 
we used to live in Gary, Indiana. When I first got married, I was, I, I was pitiful poor. You say, Myron, what's pitiful poor? That's when you're so poor, poor people feel sorry for you. <laughs> like people broke as a joke, ready to choke. Said, man, that joke, I thought I was poor. That joke a po, right? And uh, yeah, he's, he, he ain't poor, he po. He's so poor, he can't afford the other O or the R, right? He po. And, 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 and I remember, like I used to buy old raggedy cars and sell them. Actually, actually, I would sell them first and then buy them. Like, like you talk about tapping into creativity. I go knock on somebody's door. They got a car sitting in their yard. It's been sitting there for months. Hey, you want to sell that car? Um, sure. Tell you what. How much you want for it? Uh, three hundred dollars. I give you five hundred dollars for it if you let me pay you for it after I sell it. Okay. But it needs a transmission. That's okay. I know how to put transmission. In. So I'm gonna take the car. I'm gonna tow it to my house. I'm gonna put a transmission in it. I'm gonna sell it for a thousand. I'm gonna pay that person. 500, we're going to go get the title signed over to the person when they're buying it. I put the car in the paper and the classified ads. That's something they had before y'all had, before they had the internet. They had these things called newspapers, classified ads. So I put it in the classified ads. And I remember every time we sold a car, me and my wife would celebrate by going to AmVets and going shopping. Wow. AmVets is like Salvation Army, Goodwill. I know some of y'all are like, what's AmVets? Young people these days, just pray, just pray for them, y'all. Just pray for them. Don't judge them. Okay, so, so, but here's what you got to do. When you have a win, take time to celebrate the win. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and what? God saw that it was good. Like, my friend Josh and Ashley and their wonderful children are back there. They're here today from Texas, by, I mean, from, from Michigan by way of Texas where they live now. And, um... And I love the fact that they work together as a family. I worked together as a family with my kids when they were young. That's why my son and my daughter now, that they're adults in their 30s, they still work with me. They have their own stuff, but they work with me too. Why? We have a family business. So we celebrated by taking great vacations. We celebrated by doing things together. Like when you have a win, make sure all the people on your team win with you. So, okay. Um, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. Have you taken the time to celebrate the wins you've, that you had in 2022? You want to have more wins in 2023, and you haven't even celebrated the wins you had in 2022. Why are you tripping? Y'all, you know I'm telling the truth, right? Like, take time to step back, be grateful, celebrate the wins. Like, go out to eat, do something. Celebrate with the people who helped you win. Okay, here we go. Then it says, and th- I love this part, and God divided the light from the darkness. What's that? God created distinction. God is a God of distinction. There's, there's not anything that's everything because everything is something. What does that mean? God separated the light from the darkness, which, that, which means what? They're different. They're different. Light ain't the same as darkness. Love ain't the same as hate. Up ain't the same as down. Wet ain't the same as dry. Hot ain't the same as cold. Old ain't the same as young. God created a concept called distinction. Guess what? I have news for you. I know people are going to disagree with me, but this new stuff they just made up. A man is not a woman, and a woman is not a man. There's distinction. Some people say, well, man, why do you grow that, have that beard on your face that makes you look older? Older than what? I, I, am, I am older. <laughs> what do you want me to do, look 16, 35? Man, I ain't been 35 in so long, I don't even remember what it felt like. Why you got that? That beard makes you, you look 20 years older. I am 20 years older, baby. Here's what the scripture says. The glory of young men is their strength, but the beauty of old men is their gray head. This is my distinction. This tells the world that I know something I didn't know when I couldn't do this right here. I have a beard on my face. You know what that tells people? I am not a woman, and I am not a child. I didn't always have a beard. I was reading the Bible one day. And the, God's interesting, because some of the stuff he says doesn't, like, it doesn't resonate right away. Like, what's that about? Right? And one of the things he told the Israelites that was a law in Israel, in the Old Testament, he said, thou shalt not round the corners of thy beard. Like, why? <laughs> Who cares? Right? God cares. And I don't know that he cares now. I don't, I, don't, I don't know he cared then. He probably hasn't changed since he doesn't change. But he said, thou shalt not round the corners of thy beard. I'm not, saying there's any, I'm not saying it's a sin to round the corners of your beard. That's not what I'm saying. That's not my point. But I asked myself the question, why did he say that? Well, first of all, if he said, thou shalt not round the corners of thy beard, it acknowledges 
that God likes the idea of there being a distinction between a man and a woman. Why? Because he made us different. He didn't make men better than women, and he didn't make women better than men. He made men different from women and women different from men. And we can call something different, but it don't change it. Right? If I call the sky the ground, the sky is not the ground. Just saying. By the way, let me say this. Some people may, you may disagree with me, and that's fine. I celebrate your right to do so. Okay? And I may disagree with you, and you may or may not celebrate my right to do so. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Give yourself a test to see if you really believe the things you say they be, you believe, whether they be things about the Bible or things about anything else, things culturally, things uh, that political correctness, whatever. Whatever you want to believe, give yourself this test. Ask yourself this question about the things you claim to believe. Can you believe it by yourself? Because if I believe something, if I really believe something, I can believe it all by myself. See, I don't need you to believe that Jesus is the Savior. Believe it or don't believe it. That's between you and God. I don't need you to believe that. I believe it anyway. I, I don't need you to believe the Bible is the word of God. Believe it or don't believe it. I believe it. I don't need you to believe it. I'm not going to try to get you. You may be a racist. You may think all black people are like less than human. Good. Do your thing. I don't, I, I, I'm not even going to have an argument with you about that. Because Mark Twain warned me about that. He said, if you argue with an idiot, he's going he to bring you down to his level and beat you with experience. <laughs> right? I'm not going to argue with you about that. But I'm going to let you believe it. I believe that I'm as good as any human being that God has ever made, and I'm better than any human being God has ever made to fulfill my assignment. And I don't need you to believe that. I don't need you to believe anything I just said. Because if you can believe something, you can believe it all by yourself. And if you have to recruit other people and force them to go along with you, it's because you know it ain't true in the first place. Anyway, it's just a little test. Just a little test, not a big test. Okay. Okay. So God said, God divided the light from the darkness. Why? Because light ain't darkness and darkness ain't light. Here's what has to happen, y'all. We have to understand nothing is everything and everything is something. That's why people say, well, my business is good for everybody. There's no such thing. If it's good for everybody, it's good for nobody. How do you, be, how do you be, become more productive? Uh, by having uh, distinction. What separates you from every other business that does something remotely similar? Is that a good question? I think, that's a, I think that's the question. It's so fascinating. So I, like, I know Bible-believing Christian people who think that, oh, I'm, I, I don't admire and all he cares about is money. All he wants is that. Like, I don't even have time to have that conversation. <laughs> because people who come to that conclusion, they come to that conclusion because they don't know me. Period. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to contend with it. I'm not going to have the conversation. I'm not going to have an argument about it. Do what works for you. Right. Um, but here's what, here's what's, here's what's one of, one of the many things that's fascinating to me is um, I've had people like churches that I used to speak at, they would invite me to come speak. One church said, one um, pastor came to me one time. He said, and he's a good, dear friend of mine, different. He passed away recently, but he still was a dear friend. He said, he said, Brother Meyer, when you come, do you mind not talking about the business and stuff? We just want our people to be content with their jobs. <laughs> okay. Well, no, no, there's no judgment. There's no judgment. I just knew I didn't need to go there anymore. I'm cool with that. that if that's what you want your people to believe, I can't help you help them believe that because I don't believe it. I celebrate your right to believe that and your right to lead those people to believe that, but I can't help you believe it. Okay. So distinction, and then we're going to do one. Well, one or two or three or four or five more because there's a whole bunch. Like, this chapter is chock full of these principles of productivity. And can you imagine if you started applying these things to your life and to your business, how much better your business would be? Like, what if you had, uh, when people ask you what you do, you actually gave them an answer that set you apart from everybody else? See, because when people ask you what you do, they're not really asking you what you do. What are they asking you? They're asking you, what can you do for me? And when you give them an answer, it cannot be a word salad. Well, what we do is we set up distribution for the arbitrage of the information that we collate from the organization to disseminate that out into society by various means of repetition and replication. Like, what? Here's what you have to do. When you tell people what you do, don't just tell them what you do. Tell them what you can do for them. 
make sure that when you tell them, make sure that first and foremost, whatever you tell them is measurable. People will not pay you for something they cannot measure. There needs to be a clear before and a clear after. Before me, you could only do this, but after me, you can do this. I'm going to show you what I mean in a minute. It needs to be measurable. It needs to be a clear before and a clear after. It needs to be desirable. Not desirable for you to sell it to them. Desirable for them to have that transformation. Whatever transformation you provide for money needs to be something the marketplace desires. So it needs to be measurable. It needs to be desirable. Something, an outcome they desire to have. Are y'all tracking? And then lastly, it needs to be statable, preferably in a sound bite. What does that look like? Myron, what do you do? I help author, speakers, coaches, agency owners, and other high-level entrepreneurs create, convey, and convert premium value offers faster and better than any coach in the business space. In fact, while other coaches are doing their best to help their clients have six and seven figure years, I'm actually helping my clients have six and seven figure days. Now, you may not believe that I can do that, but at least you know what I could do so you can know whether you believe it or not. And either I can do that, and I'm telling the truth, or I am like a sociopath, psychopathic liar who would be willing to say something like that that can't be proven, but I can, like, we got the receipts, baby. We can line up, we can line up dozens of people who've made $100,000 in a day because of stuff I taught them. We can line up dozens of people who made a million dollars in a day because of stuff I taught them. People who never had a million dollar a year before, within a couple of months, have a million dollar a day. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you because there has to be distinction. You, whatever you say about what you're going to do for them has to be measurable, desirable, and statable. And if it's not those things, it's word salad. It doesn't even have any dressing. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. And then it says, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the first principle we get from that verse, what verse is that? Evening and the morning were first, that's only verse number five, wow. Okay, evening and morning, first day. The first one we see is preparation for execution. Notice it didn't say the morning and the evening were the first day. What did it say? The evening and the morning were the first day. The Roman calendar starts with the sun. The Jewish calendar starts with the moon. The Roman calendar starts during the day. The Jewish calendar starts at night. What do we see? One of the things that God is showing us, I believe, in this is the best time to prepare for today was last night. Your evening should be preparation for your morning, and then you will have a great day. Yesterday should be preparation for today. Last week should be preparation for this week. Last month should be preparation for this month. Last, month, last year should be preparation for this year. Last decade should be preparation for next, year, next decade. The evening and the morning were the first day, not the morning and the evening were the second, first day. But then it says the evening and the morning were the first day in verse 5. So the second thing we see in that is we see segmentation to completion. Because the next day God's going to do something else. He's going to say the evening and the morning were the second day. What do we see? We see segmentation to completion. What does that tell us? God didn't save any of today's work for tomorrow. He got today's work done today and tomorrow's work done tomorrow. One of the reasons you don't get today's work done today is because you have too many to-dos on your today list. Did I say that too fast? You have too many to-dos on your today list. And so you don't get all of them done. And you feel overwhelmed and some days you don't get any of them done. So have a couple of things that you've prepared the day before that you absolutely must get done. And if you get anything else done, it's a bonus. By the way, we're just getting started. We'll pick up where we left off next week on more productivity hacks for 2023 that can make you rich. But this is, this is I'm talking about automatic success principles from Genesis chapter 1 because God didn't just tell us that he's creative. He told us he created us to be like him, which means he created us to create stuff. He made us to make stuff. And as if that in itself is not good enough, he gave us a blueprint for everything he created so that when we go out to create the things he created us to create, we can be as productive as possible following his blueprint. I hope this blesses you beyond measure. Share this YouTube channel with somebody. Like it, comment on it, subscribe. 
Share it with your friends and neighbors. Hit the notification bell so you get notified um, when we come go live or come up with another YouTube video. We have another short that's coming out tomorrow, another long-form video that's coming out on Friday. Um, the next segment in Bishop Wayne Malcolm's uh, series is coming out on Friday. Guys, I appreciate y'all, guys and girls, more than you know. Um, do all the YouTube stuff I forgot to say. And in the meantime, in between time, I look forward to seeing y'all next Wednesday. By the grace of God, peace out, Cub Scouts. All right. Let it run for a few minutes, Larry. Isn't the Bible amazing? What's that?